Hello and welcome to episode 50 of the Rollo and Slappy Show. Today is, got to check my uh, thing for this, Monday, July 31st, 2017. I'm Rollo McFlugel and with me is Slappy Jones too and we are both at McFlugel.com. Show notes page for this episode is McFlugel.com slash 50. Hey, it is, I guess 50 is kind of a big deal for, I don't know, is this is like the golden it, episode. Golden? Is it silver? What's 50? I think it's gold. I think it's gold. So cool. All right. So <laughs> Slappy already in, interrupted me. So why don't you just take it from here and uh, tell us what we're talking about tonight? Yeah. Thank you, Rallo. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to, to listen to us for 20 to 30 minutes today. Uh, we're going to talk about in the free market how there are incentives to be efficient and have less waste. Uh, just this past weekend, I met with a couple friends and we talked about these uh, issues. And, and one, I, of course, I brought up the topic of living in a stateless society. And one of my friends, of course, countered and said, one of the things that would concern him are monopolies. Now, ironically, his uh, solution to getting rid of these monopolies is having a monopoly on force. But that's besides the point. Let's say, let's take, um, let's just say, it's possible, sure, you could have a free market monopoly. You provide the best good or service at the best price. No one can compete with you. Uh, you even buy up some competitors who are willing to sell um, their company to you. And there's high barriers to entry, so let's use oil as an example. Wouldn't that be a problem in a free market, uh, Rollo, if one oil company pretty much had a monopoly or a huge market share, maybe not a hundred percent but maybe eighty percent and really could control the supply and the price of, of oil wouldn't that be a huge issue who would be there to stop it and uh, what, what could result in that well I think there's a few solutions to this supposed problem uh, one is that when someone has a monopoly it sends signals normally that they're raising nor are they raising prices. Right. Well, the fear of a monopoly that people always have is that they'll be able to price everyone out and people won't be able to afford it. Right. Only so, the yeah. rich. Only the rich will afford it. So the people yeah. who have it will get rich and the rich people will benefit from that product. But all us little guys will be priced out of the market and we'll just be stuck. So that's the right. fear. Like so it, let's address that fear. Like if Walmart became a, a monopoly in their industry, they would start raising the prices so that no one could buy anything from them. Right. Exactly. Well, no, the, only the rich people could buy it. Right. <laughs> well, you know, that's what that's what the argument is. And of course, it's absurd. But honestly, that's what people will say routinely is that they'll raise the prices so high that only rich people could have. It. And it would just be like the rich against the poor and the rich have everything and the poor have nothing. Yeah. <sighs> that doesn't even uh, really make sense because most businesses I, let's use walmart for example walmart is a is a business that is geared towards people of really lower lower to middle class uh statuses and they keep prices cheap and they, and they sell a ton of stuff and they're one of the most powerful and, and richest businesses in the world whereas something like maserati whose uh clients are really rich people who can afford, you know, really expensive cars that are basically toys. They're, they come nowhere close to the to the size that, that Walmart is. So if you have like a, a couple rich people buy, I mean, what are they going to do? If, if oil had that problem and, and it became, you know, $10,000 a gallon, well, I mean, you're not going to sell much. Just even even if rich people could afford it. Right. Well, let's take your Walmart example. Um, because we had a Walmart open in my area recently. And people will say this all the time about Walmart. Uh, I'll take them at their word. It's not that that hard to believe that Walmart puts small mom and pop shops out of business because they're able to scale their products, cut prices low, which drives these smaller stores out of business. Um, what if, like, they have in a lot of places, We, I, th I, th I think it's fair to assume, or at least take them at their word, that Walmart could potentially be the only store or one of the only stores. What if they start raising their prices? What are people going to do? Okay. Well, if they're raising prices, then that cre that sends a signal to other people that says, hey, this is a, a lucrative market to get into. And as long as there's no sort of coercion 
that prevents people from entering the marketplace, then people are free to, you know, test the waters and go in and, and offer their their prices to customers to be a little bit cheaper and take some of that business from Walmart. And if Walmart doesn't respond by lowering the prices to compete, then they're going to lose a lot of the market share. And until that, uh, you know, that, that would probably drive prices down because Walmart's going to try to compete and it'll hit that equilibrium point again. And if in the meantime, Walmart or say another business starts to get better and more efficient at it, then maybe they, they lower their prices. Um, it, it's all, none of this is bad for the consumer. It's actually very good for the consumer because all these businesses are competing Wait for their second. business. Are you saying lower prices frees up more money for the consumer to buy other things and improve their lifestyle? <gasps> yes, I am. Or it helps them save more. Right, uh, which they delay their consumption, which puts more capital into the economy to make a more productive society. Uh, another example that was used in this talk on the weekend, I mean, it was very similar to the one we just did, but what if there was a farmer in an area who was the best farmer, had all the food, had a stockpile of food, then there was a drought and other farmers just couldn't keep up with production. This guy who's the big farmer has all the production. Wouldn't all the locals kind of raid his farm and take his stuff anyway, so shouldn't we just have government redis redistribute it to begin with so that they don't raid his farm when the bad times hit? Uh, <laughs> that was a real argument. I yeah. did. I, I, I actually almost that that was the argument, the gist of it. It's kind of a non sequitur. So it's, yeah. it's tough to respond because uh, again, well, I told. Well, I, I would first of all well, go ahead. No, I was going to say I would go back to your Walmart uh, example. If there's a guy who's just growing all these tomatoes and. Hoard, like hoarding them, literally just storing them. I guess he's keeping them fresh. You know, we can assume. Well, we won't fight the hypothetical. Um, why wouldn't someone else grow them too? Or, or why wouldn't they use an alternative? Like maybe we won't have tomatoes this year. Right. So, if his if for his example to hold or have any power, he would there would have to be no alternatives. It would have. So, let's say he grows all the food. Now we're getting really absurd that one farmer just has all the food in the area. Um, I mean, that just seems a little ridiculous and impossible that other people wouldn't be also growing food. Uh, but why you would have to redistribute his savings in advance of people wanting them in the future doesn't really... Well, I don't understand why follow. he just couldn't sell at, at a higher price than he normally would and make a lot of money from it. Right. And not sell so not have a, a price so high that people wouldn't be able to afford it and therefore wouldn't buy. Right. It does no good for I mean, what happens. What happened in the, the, the Irish potato famine? I mean, there was no food. So what did people do? One else. They made. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, some of these hypotheticals, it's just kind of, yeah, it's a well, how to, and even so, how does, how does a government predict the drought? One, how does the government or, or any of this other stuff, or, or know, or know that that you know this guy's going to have all this food, and we should. Well, is he saying that the government just goes and and steals his stuff and and then distributes it? I guess, but but the whole hypothetical is kind of unfair because why would that happen in a market? There's almost no barriers to entry and growing food. You just got to get some seeds right. and some dirt and some water. Uh, I'm to all you farmers out there listening. I'm sure it's a little more complicated than that, since I grow nothing other than some grass and weeds on my property. Um, yeah, normally you need some capital equipment like a tractor or something. Yeah, 1971. So, so yeah. uh, you need a little more than just dirt and seeds, but there's a very low barrier to entry there. So I don't see why that would be an issue uh, in in a free market. Why other people wouldn't be doing that too to keep their local economies going? I mean, they can trade their goods for other goods. Why one person would do it doesn't seem to make sense, but I guess it I, it could happen. Um, but I, I just think it's it's kind of like saying if it was all on our end, if we said, well, you know, what happens when the government just locks everyone up and kills half the people and puts them in concentration camps? People would be like, that's absurd. That's not going to happen here. Um, and we hope it doesn't. But 
um, except that that has happened in real life, whereas their example has never happened in a free market. So, Yeah, I think that's one of the frustrations that was dealt with is that a lot of these hypotheticals that are brought up against us are created in a way that are impossible to be solved. So it, it it's like saying, well, what if the sky is purple and you need to find blue in the sky in order to, and you're just like, well, that, that can't happen. Right. That's not it. So how's that even, how does that prove a point? If you make a hypothetical that can't happen or can't exist or doesn't actually relate to anything uh, in reality, how's it valid? Well, I'd say it isn't. It's like any time that you have talk about private defense and someone says, well, what if someone decides to buy up all the defense that exists in the world and kill you? Well, I guess you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Why would that happen? But Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, what does that prove? That it proves nothing but or it's, why it's, people wouldn't see this guy buying up all the power and thinking maybe we need something to stop that maybe i won't sell to him and why and why the people in the defense organizations would be like oh you want us to go murder people okay we'll do that right um but anyway let's go back to the oil argument let's say because there are high barriers to entry in in oil mm -hmm. okay so one. Wait, I, I just said go back and we didn't start. Oh. Or did we? I'm getting confused with our pre-talking, pre-show pre talking. We did, talking. We did mention that, you know, there was like kind of one, or we could go over it again because enough time has passed that people might not remember exactly yeah, what we said. like the people on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, supposed, you're supposed to let that comment go by. and Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to oil because food is an easy one. There's easy, there's low barriers to entry. Almost anyone can enter it. Uh, but what about oil? High costs to get in that business. Almost impossible for any person to say, yeah, I'm going to get in the oil business, even without government involved, because just the exploration, the research, the development, the equipment, the refining, getting it to where you got to go. I can't even conceive all the expenses and the costs that go into just getting some oil out of the ground. So what if there was a guy who was really good at it and was buying it all up and had a huge market share? What if he raised the price of oil to $10 a gallon or gasoline to $10 a gallon? Because he can, because he has essentially a, a, a monopoly on the market. Right. Well, one, that's no guarantee that he would make a higher profit. I mean, it's, you don't, uh, I, and that's why the competition is, is what's best for finding that uh, equilibrium point where you can kind of maximize uh, profit right, so, to price, but but it, so, it, you know, I I just wanted to throw that point out there. I know what what you're getting. Yeah, at. just so like in a free market. Let's say he did. What we're saying, sorry to cut you off, but in a free market where prices are, that's because that's how the market set the price. Meaning, if they raise the price, they would sell less and have less profit. If they lowered the price, they may sell more and not maximize their profit. So the prices are set at the prax, uh, profit maximizing level. But let's say he's he has a you know ten down ten dollars a gallon and he's making a killing off it. So that's again it sends signals to other people that hey this is a very lucrative business to get into so let's do it. Now this is obviously different because as opposed to something like farming you can't have every Tom Dick and Harry throw some seeds in the ground and and st and start growing stuff. There's a lot of, of investment and capital equipment and employees, and, and it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, I work, I think I've mentioned it before, probably several times I work at an oil refinery, and it's, and it's absolutely amazing the amount of money we spend to do stuff um, that you can get a gallon of gas for cheaper than a gallon of milk. Because um, things cost thousands and thousands and millions of dollars. I have, you know, I have projects that are, one I'm working on now that I'm, you know, asking for, uh, it's going to be between probably three hundred fifty and four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it's not, it's big, but it's not, not huge. We've projects so, that cost a lot more. Do you guys? But um, 
Well, do you guys wear your top hat and your money bags to work every day? Yes. Okay, and we light, our, we light our cigars with $100 bills. And you wear a monocle, I'm sure. Yes. Okay. I mean, we're just like, I spend most of my day just like putting my hands against the pipes because they're bursting from all the money shooting out of them. Right. Gotcha. Just so, wanted to clarify that. Yeah. So, um, so, so what happens in that situation where it's, it's a very high barrier to entry just because of, of the cost? Well, why can't other businesses that are people or banks or whoever investment groups say, hey, let's all pull our money together and, and invest in this? Because Here's an opportunity to make some money. Let's go put some money out in order to earn a return on that. Right. Um, and if the, uh, the, the monopoly oil guy sees that and that's a signal to him. Maybe he, maybe he lowers prices and, and makes their, uh, it also investment go. It also encourages investment into alternatives. Exactly. Um, now if the price of gas was so high, it might make more sense to, div to put more resor resources into solar energy or wind energy or hydroelectric, um, all kinds of different things to try to make it more efficient to compete with gasoline. Um, right. And so that's what eventually would happen. You know, it, people always talk about running out of oil someday, or at least they used to. Uh, if we did, that just as it's getting there, we're, we would start investing more money and trying to find other energy sources. And also, it's just the ba it's it's the law of demand. People are going to start using less and start trying to conserve more as the price goes up. Correct. So. Yeah, and I, I know that's that's me fighting the hypothetical. <laughs> well, it's true though. But we we talked about how uh, you know we, we introduced this episode as how the market is efficient and saves and and comes up with creative ways to uh, use their trash and their waste to make money. Do you have examples of that in the oil industry? Yes, actually, uh, it was everyone's least favorite person in the world, J.D. Rockefeller, when he entered the market, uh, I guess, in the, oh, do you know when that was, like 1880s or something? It was late 1800s, I'm pretty sure. So back when he entered the market, came into the business, basically the oil refineries were only refining the crude into kerosene, and they were dumping the rest into rivers and stuff and caused a, a lot of pollution. It, it, it wasn't good. So he came in, and saw the opportunity to say, hey, these guys are dumping all this stuff. Maybe I can refine it further and, and make money off it. And that's exactly what he did. And he, yeah, he made huge amounts of money. Also put the whaling industry out of business too because whale oil became uh, – was more expensive than, than what he was producing and, so, and ended up a better product. As someone like me who's not in the oil industry, what do you mean by – refine the crude to kerosene then refine it further so there's different cuts so um refining oils kind of like operating it is a still because there's a lot of distillation columns mm -hmm. so you heat it's it's a process of heating it um and then putting it through like a tower like a big column and you take different cuts at different levels so different densities of your of your oil and that's different products and then and then you put it through like reactors and stuff and which adds like a chemical it helps it uh react a certain way uh you've got like a uh, catalyst crack so you're, you're kind of cracking the uh or breaking the the hydrocarbon chains with with things and um really it's just heating it up cooling it down and taking different cuts of the density doing that over and over again adding some chemicals here and there so, to help break it down to what you want it to, but just as like, you know, you have crude oil, which is what you get out of the ground, right? How many products do you think are made out of crude oil? <laughs> um, there's. Well, what, I mean, is Vaseline? I I know that's called petroleum jelly. Is that out of crude oil? I actually don't know. Or plas plastics. Yeah, there's plastics are, are taken from it, but. I mean, it's tough to say because, I, I mean, the, the big products are, well, the tough thing is you say, oh, gasoline, right? Well, gasoline is actually a blend of a lot of different uh, okay. products. 
I mean, we make there's asphalt. There's like heavy okay. gas oil. So anyway, we're getting uh, we're we're going into details on on oil here. But the bottom yeah, line, yeah, you should is, have had a, you should have had one of the chemical engineers here, not the uh, yeah. But but <laughs> really, the the bottom line is. They were originally refining crude oil into kerosene only and had lots of waste. Rockefeller figured we can do something with that waste and refined it further to help make gasoline. Well, what was he refining it further to? Do you know? Um, I don't know what it was, but okay. I, I I mean, they're mostly kerosene was for like lighting and I guess right, right. heating too, but um I mean, it turned into. I mean, you've used butane for your lighter. Sure. Propane, people use that in their grills. Asphalt for roads. Uh, there's, you know, jet fuel, diesel fuel. Um. And then even even what we do now is we have a sulfur plant. A lot of a lot of refineries have this. Is that we're we're trying to pull sulfur out of the uh, out of the gasoline, well, out of out of the crude and and the products to get it on spec. Um, so when you're pulling the sulfur out of your your product, it just doesn't disappear. It goes somewhere. So we we pull the sulfur out and actually just sell the elemental sulfur. Huh? How about that? Places. So actually, when they say, oh, because it's a lot of it is uh, the government regulations for uh, keep the sulfur down. Um, go away. It's still it still goes somewhere. Yeah, well it still exists in the earth. So, yeah. I guess you're you're not putting it in the air as quick. I don't know what it is, but um, and anyway, there would be a market incentive to because people do need sulfur. So there's a market incentive to pull it out. Absolutely. So. So there's many uses of crude. Many, many, many. That people continue to find more, and we find more ways to use that in quotes, waste to make more money and which would probably also drive down prices as the supply increases. Yeah, um, I wish I could say more about the uh, yeah, kind of, products, but I'm, well, I'm I more kind of put you on the on, spot there. That wasn't yeah. really nice of me, but, you know. My job is more keep it in the pipes, not right. what products gotcha. I'm making. Although it, was good to, it, it is good to know. Yeah. So, and any other examples of the market using waste that you can think of off the top of your head as they put you on the spot again? Yeah. Um, yeah, I take a. I was gonna make a stupid joke, but I don't even. It would have been terrible. And it would have went over uh, my head, and no one would have laughed anyway. I know. No. Um. Oh, I just went out of my head. I'm saving the one that I know you're asking about. Um. Oh, that's right. In Europe, they. Uh, and I don't know if this is if this is like heavily subsidized and and would never exist in the market. You know, someone. Someone correct me in the comments somewhere, but uh, I know in Europe, and I'm sure there's places in the U.S. too, they do this, but landfills, they uh, produce from the decomposition for energy. Um, Wasn't there a that's, guy, that's kind of, on, we, we should find out who that was on the Tom Wood show a couple of weeks ago, who um, using oh, some kind of flies. Black, black soldier flies. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, they, they, they take food waste and... Uh, Farm farms where they grow flies, and it sounds creepy and weird and disgusting. But the flies are actually very antisocial, so they don't bother people, and they eat literally everything that humans eat, and a lot of human uh, like food waste. So you just throw this trash into these uh, fly farms. They eat it, and they use the flies and grind them up and make uh, animal food, animal feed with it. So it's actually it's it's really neat. Yeah, uh, and that, that cuts that down on landfills episode. and provides food for livestock, right? Is that is that what he's doing? And yeah. just I mean, people compost all the time. And you've right. You got vegetable and fruit waste, and and it's great for uh, great for your garden. Now uh, I know what you were asking about, and I guess we'll tie this into the free market success story. But uh, so I'm down the shore on vacation with uh, some of my family and my dad and I are going to be going crabbing maybe tomorrow morning, maybe not. Um, but uh, our favorite bait to use for catching crabs is it's called flounder backs. So flounder is like a flat fish if, if you're not familiar with it. And uh, when they fillet it, 
what's left behind is basically just like the the head of the fish, the fin, some guts, and just kind of like a spine with a little bit of meat left that's between all the bones that you can't get from filleting it. And it's trash. It's garbage. What are you going to use that for? Um, but it's great for crabbing bait. So you go to a lot of these seafood places and you know you go up to the counter and they don't have it displayed and they normally don't advertise it. You say, hey, you got any flounderbacks? And if they do, you get like a dozen of them for like a couple bucks. Whereas you go to a bait store and you're buying uh, bunkers of fish that, that people use and you know it's a couple bucks per fish. People also use raw chicken, which is good bait, but it's uh, with people eating that as food, so it's it's also it's not exactly a cheap. Well, the flounderbacks are literally or used to be or trash. You just throw it out. You you got the fish, you fly it, you throw out the rest of it. Yeah, you, you go to the bay. You go back to the bay and everything where people are coming back from fishing, and you see packs of fish. Literally, they just throw them in the water, right? Uh, because they're trash, and you know it's it's their crabs and other animals and everything you need them. So it's not. It's not. It's good that they do it. It's, um, but yeah, people literally just throw it away. But um, you can actually make some money off it, and then you know some of us are willing to buy it for for cheap, but good bait. Right. And it's another way for the business, whoever is filleting that, to make a couple extra bucks on stuff they had anyway, which in turn could possibly lower prices to make them more competitive. Uh, and there's no reason why other stores couldn't do that, but it lowers prices for consumers if they want to, you know, and still be profitable. Right. Even speaking of crabs, um, you know, you go to the, the crab, I don't want to call them refine, crab processing plants where they crab pull refinery. the crab meat. Yeah, crab refinery. And uh, I think this is on Dirty Jobs or something, processing plant. And what they do is after they cook the crabs and, and pull the meat out of all of them, they take all the guts and the shells and everything and grind it into this paste and it's used for crab flavoring. Interesting. So it's like they literally use everything in the crab. Right. It's pretty neat. Yeah. And there would really, I mean, if you're, you know, if that was centrally planned, why would they even think to do that? Right. But so, I don't know. Anything else to add? Any other free market in, uh, stories? I think that was a good free market episode. No, I'm I'm pretty, yeah. I mean, normally I only listen until I can get a tractor story or tractor comment in, so. Yeah, but you threw that in earlier, so. Yeah. So, it's pretty amazing that you're able to keep my attention for this long. Right. <laughs> well, good. I hope we kept everyone else's attention. Yeah. So, uh, show notes page again for this episode is mcflugel.com slash 50. You'll find links to subscribe to the podcast on both iTunes and Stitcher, as well as uh, ways to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our email list. So, questions, concerns, or comments, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you, and we would love for you to share us as well. Yeah, if you have any friends who are just getting into this or just learning about it, we like to talk to them, so send them our way, show them an episode or two, and tell them that we will respond to their questions. All righty. Thanks for listening. Catch you next week. Peace.